and then we're going to go to 70. We're going to go, that was 1, that was 2, to 68, and then 1 past 0 to 8. Hey YouTube! So, found this in a junk pile at the Hack Lab and figured this is such an artifact of 1980s, 1990s technology that uh, it'd be worth looking at. You won't see this every day, and in fact I can't even track down uh, what company logo this is. I've tried some image searches and I just simply can't track down. So if you know who or what, like, what company this is, let me know. But what this is, is the 1980s, 1990s analog equivalent of a security system alarm panel. Um, back in the day before microcontrollers were readily available, you would need some kind of relay operated logic and some kind of a switch. So how do you make sure that the user of a switch is authorized? Well, you would hide it behind a combination, um, or a lock, or a key, or something to that effect. Um, it's, it's a little easier to, I guess, train people to use a combination lock than make additional copies of keys um, that could potentially be stolen or lost. You'd have to have the uh, trusted individuals with the combination um, basically be compromised and lose the combination if it's written down somewhere, things like that. Uh, and bear in mind this is like 1980s, 1990s, so no one's going to have electronic devices with which they can accidentally uh, leak the combination. Um, full disclosure, this came out of a junk pile and I'm going to build it into some kind of just a funny project, so I will be showing the combination that's used for this lock. Um, it won't ever be used to secure anything important, so just kind of operational security disclaimer up front. So let's dive into what this thing is. It is a dial combination lock. It's got a very nice tactile click. I'm going to put some clicky noises on a uh, microphone kind of as an overlay. But uh, it's a dial lock with a push to test indicator lamp and a uh, just a regular, I guess, incandescent bulb lamp on a what feels like a stainless steel uh, wall mount plate that has no visible um, fasteners from the outside. So it's it's tamper resistant um, and definitely tamper evident. You can't really mess with this without you know being on the other side of this. On the reverse side we have this uh, standard kind of bell security wire solid core uh, five or six conductor. Uh, we've got the back of the dial lock itself. We've got what looks like a quarter twenty um, stud here and it's actually interesting because it's seemingly copper brazed on it's not just uh, like a, a PEM insert or anything this looks like it might have even been hand brazed so this stud is the uh, means by which this panel is fastened to a, a wall in a secure fashion you have to be an authorized user coming in from the rear side of this other than that you've got two terminals for the indicator lamp and um, what looks like three terminals and the spring-loaded backside that um, is not connected to anything. And as a kind of pull from a system during demolishing, um, obviously all the wires are kind of just snipped off. Um, on the combination lock itself, we've got two sets of wires, and these wires correspond to arm and disarm. You'll see the panel here, activate alarm, and on the other side, um, sorry, deactivate alarm and activate on this side. Um, I've written this down for convenience later when we play around with it, but uh, long story short is there's two sets of wires, one to arm, one to disarm, and they're just contact closures, that's it. Um, we are going to try and get into here tonight. Now, Knowing how combination locks work, it's not like the contacts are at the back of the dial lock. Likely, the three wheels for this have um, conductive patches on the side of the wheels, so that when the wheels are aligned, as you rotate this around, and the wheels, well, let's just use this roll of tape. All right, so here's my little quick analog of a dial combination lock. It's just three rolls of tape and a marker to kind of hold it together. Um, my suspicion is that inside here, there's two sets of contacts. I've only drawn one on the tape rolls just to minimize waste of tape. Um, 
but effectively as you dial the first combination wheel it eventually picks up the second one and then you have to set it or sorry you have to pull it till it picks up the third one and then you have to set it in the correct position here and then you'll reverse the first wheel and it'll eventually pick up the second wheel and you have to spin it until you get the correct number which lines up two contacts and then you set the third wheel like so making a complete circuit across all three wheels ultimately connecting one of the two contacts so my suspicion is, is that it's not going to be easy to um, pick because there's no mechanical detent at the end of the three spools and there's two positions there would be one here for either arm or disarm and then there would be another one for arming and disarming um, so having said that let's actually dive into this alright for the sake of this teardown I am going to be a little bit destructive um, yes this is an artifact that I'll probably never find again but I'm not going to be destructive for the important part which is the dialogue these two indicator lamps I'm going to replace with modern LED equivalents um, or maybe I'll keep them I don't know I'm not too worried about saving the wiring because there's some kind of custom bodgery going on here so just get rid of that zip tie and feed this wire through it's, it's actually like an epoxy or something it's it's pretty hard but on this side it's just silicone caulk. Oh, can I actually peel this out? And they squirted it in, but maybe they didn't get it deep enough to actually mechanically lock onto anything. So let's see if I can figure out what was in here. And use forceps instead. See if I can pull this out. Is that a transistor? Let's step this open and find out. Now this would have been wired up in a security system to, uh, oh that's interesting, Okay, so this rubber tubing was really just a sleeve to facilitate the rest of it. Alright, so it looks like we've got a resistor, one lead, another wire in there, um, and just a uh, some kind of transistor. Three-legged components, this transistor is probably to turn on an indicator lamp. Um, so some of these wires are probably just going to be like 12 volt or something, and then the rest of them are going to be signal wires. Um, Either that, or it was intended to take a signal from the dial, uh, from the dial lock, uh, off of one of these leads, and uh, power one of the indicator lights to say that you've made a correct circuit. So, nothing particularly special in here, it's just epoxy potted, probably because they couldn't get the greatest gasket on this uh, metal plate, so they would just want to make sure that this is um, at least some degree of weather resistance. Alright. Let's see here. Get rid of you, and you, and you. That is all garbage. Alright, so we got the important wires here, which I don't want to cut, and we've got some indicator lights. Interesting that the um, panel light was basically held in by four wings here that just fold in. I think I've almost got this free. So there's the lamp. Oh, I should snip the wires off a little closer here. This looks like it's just a pretty standard indicator lamp, and you can't even replace the. Uh, Looks like it's an Amphenol device. Yeah, no big deal. I'm gonna replace it anyways. All right, going back to this guy. Uh, we have another indicator light from 
Anaheim, Ohio? No, sorry, Anaheim, California. I'm Canadian. I don't have the best knowledge of American geography. So these panels would have also been handmade back in the day, too. Um, so there's probably small alignment features and blemishes here and there. Um, slightly different hole sizes, too. Interesting. Um, this looks like it's just a regular indicator lamp. This I actually might try and save, depending on the voltage, but the bulb itself is interesting. The bulb is actually embedded in the push-to-test button, so you unscrew the entire light with the cap, and you replace the cap with the light. That's kind of crazy, so maybe I can't replace this if the bulb's burnt out. I'm going to look at these later. They're not the reason for this video, so I'm going to set those aside. We won't talk about them more. All right, so... Before we actually disassemble this, I want to play around with it and show you kind of how it behaves on camera. So I don't know which contact actually is which. Um, we'll have to find out as we go. Might have to try both combinations. We will see. Alright, so I'm going to hook up to the lower set of contacts, the red and blue contacts. So if we get a signal, across these wires, the multimeter will beep. Let's try the three digit combination because the lower side is closer to this. Seems like it'd be logical. Three turns past zero, I don't know, four turns, whatever, to 70. Left two times, that's one, that's two to 68. I don't really feel anything when I reach the correct position. Uh, and then one turn past zero to eight. Nothing. So maybe it's on the other set of contacts. Yep. Okay, so deactivate is black and yellow, and if I push it too much further, then we'll go back. So maybe I can, yeah, okay, I can still futz around with that top dial. Oh, wow, it's interesting. It's actually got, oh, it's only two digits off. Either way, let's try that one more time. So I'm going to scramble the combination, and then we're going to go to 70. We're going to go, that was one, that was two. 2 to 68, and then 1 past 0 to 8. There we go. So that was one combination. Now let's try the other one. It's only a two digit combination, so I wonder why it's one digit fewer. I guess it's a little less important to have a secure means of arming it versus disarming it. So two turns right to 43. That's yeah, 43. And then once past 0 to 41. Easy as that. So it's an electric switch with two sets of contacts behind a dial combination. Let's dive in and see how this thing's actually assembled on the inside. I really hope I don't screw this up because I really want to reuse this thing. It's so cool. So, um,. Yeah, let's try not to have a lock sport gutting fail, especially with a combination uh, device. I'm going to undo these retaining nuts, being the 80s or 90s, they're probably 440 threaded, imperial. Yeah, they're imperial threaded. Um, oh wow, okay, those threads are maybe a little bit chowdered up a little, so it's a little hard to remove that. I really should just get a nut driver, but I'm already here with the multi-tools, so just get this done. Alright. There we go. So, there's no indication of who makes this. I just have an activate and a deactivate label. Um, and initials? I don't know if that's the manufacturer or the, like, the actual assembly line guy. Um, there's no keying or alignment pin to make sure that you get this right side up. 
it's a hand assembled job. Um, the, you know, the plate's just a plate. Um, so presumably these, these two screws go deeper in here. Um, this is metal, but it's die cast and plated, it seems, so I'm kind of curious what metal that is. Probably zinc. Alright, camera's rolling. Let's not screw this up. Oh. Oh. So these are actually solid machine threads. They're, this is not a nut. This is... This was a hexagonal bar stock of steel that they laid down and then threaded on both sides. That is a really custom funky fastener. Alright, let's undo this one here. Can I get the back panel off, or is it press fit? Um, I'm going to take my bad tweezers here and see if I can get, can't get it under. No, not really. I used a pick. Not a lock pick, just a, a pick for pulling springs and things. Ah, there we go. I'm in. Okay. Stamped plate of steel. Um, nothing special besides the cutouts are not at a full 90, so maybe there's a reason for that. We have the um, front dial that interacts with this nylon piece here. You know what, I'm going to just put the pick away and just use my tweezers again. We have the uh, front dial which interacts with this element here and it picks up the rearmost dial and you can see some contacts on the side here which are pretty hefty in terms of the spring loading. Um, I'm a little afraid to disassemble this further um, because this is old plastic and while it functions okay um, when assembled, if I strain it with assembly and disassembly it may crack some of the plastic. Um, additionally, I don't have the tool necessary to fold these back. I mean, presumably they had some kind of a jig that would, uh, almost like hemostats or something, to pull all of the springs back. There's actually a considerable amount of force behind these. Um, okay, so what else can we see here? Let's see if I can get this on camera. So, pull this out of the way. This is all, like, hand-assembled. This is epoxied in place. Um, there might be some alignment pins for these beryllium copper thingies, spring contacts. But um, the rearmost wheel, you can see a what appears to be a folded piece of copper on the side, just folded over, and it looks like it's heat staked in position here. Um, and it wraps around the wheel. It looks like it actually wraps around the wheel like a, a clip on the side. So you would have to get all three of these in alignment from the rear. Okay, so black and yellow wires are deactivate and they do have all three wheels um, connected in series electrically. Um, and that's also interesting too because the um, the contacts, each wheel has two contacts. So let me just draw this out for you real quick. The um, black wire coming in and then there's a momentary switch to wheel one, wheel two, and wheel three, and then the other wire out. So you have to manipulate all three dial wheels in order to get this wheel to line up, and then this wheel to line up, and then finally this wheel to line up. Now, that makes it hard to manipulate the, um, the lock and try and pick it, because you're not trying to pick with something that can bind. There's there's no binding, there's very little mechanical feel difference when you reach this position here. So um, just the nature of this having very little if no 
feel there's there's no difference in feel when the wheel passes the um the copper contact there might be a slight audible difference Hey, okay, I can hear a slight audible difference. But you can only hear the audible difference for the rearmost wheel. When you engage all three wheels, you're hearing several contacts, or several, several wheels worth of clicks from the spring-loaded contacts at the same time. And you might hear different sounds from these contacts versus those contacts. So if you were to try and use like a stethoscope or something, you would get all sorts of false signals from this side and this side as you engage each of the wheels. Way to do this is we get um, three correct numbers out of um, three, five, is that right? Yeah, eight. We have to find the three correct, or listen for the three correct clicks out of eight other false signals out of a total of 11. So statistically, if you were just to listen to the clicks, you might get lucky. It's a 27% chance of nailing it, but then you start multiplying these together and your odds go down quite significantly. This is the 27% chance is optimistic, assuming you can actually hear the difference between real and false. I, I don't even know how to compute the number of combinations here um, where you would pick up the the real and the false audible signals from each click at each layer of this pancake. Um, yeah, I'm not super good at statistics here. Um, it's an interesting construction. I'm really reluctant to go deeper because I may screw up the reassembly process. It, it looks like you need a special jig here to um, reassemble it because you would have to hold this in place and have another tool hold that in place. Um, in order to assemble and disassemble this stack. I don't want to snap these wheels. Um, other than that, it looks like it's all just injection molded plastic, so you really won't be able to do much more than just look at the back here and maybe apply a little bit of lubricant. It's an interesting construction for sure. Um, I'm gonna have to think of what I can do with this, but I'm gonna start reassembling this now. What I wanna do is build some sort of a, I don't know, a box or a challenge device to see if you can solve the riddle and get at the, you know, electric lock. That's, it's just a satisfying tactile feel. I'll uh, have to overlay some audio of the clicking, but it just sounds so good. Also, interestingly, there's a slight taper, it seems. I don't know if the camera can see it. Um, it looks like there's an ever so slight taper in the housing, too. Um, probably to aid in the die cast molding and the relief angle so that this actually releases from the mold. Um, but yeah, this is just a really cool lock. You'll never see one of these again. So, yeah, I'm going to reassemble this a little bit and put it into a project. Uh, if you like this video, please like, subscribe, comment. Leave a message down in the comments if you've ever dealt with these, if you were an installer and you remember these things, and what company actually made these. Um, I doubt I will ever be able to find another one of these, like on eBay or anything, but you never know. Uh, until next time, though, peace out.